I, I like to ask questions. So which, which, what is this? What are we looking at here? It's a Texas flag from the Republic of Texas. We were the only state that was a country of its own. What's it called? No, that's the Gonzales flag. Gonzales. This is from, from Gonzales, Texas. Because, you know, remember, Texas was once part of Mexico. We were Texicans, not Texans. And when, when we decided to leave Mexico, not because we disliked Mexico, but because Santa Ana broke the Constitution of 1832, we decided to leave. And so the Mexicans had given the Texicans a cannon to protect themselves from the Indians, which was pretty useless and because against people on horseback. And the Mexicans came to get the cannon back, but it was spring and the, wa the river was swollen. So they sent a guy across in a boat to the Texicans and said, we want our cannon back. And the Texicans sent him back in the boat and raised this flag. So that's the Gonzales flag. The other thing that's always fun to ask is, as Dr. Rule talked about Sondergaard's groove and separating the left and right atrium, can you separate them completely apart from each other? You can. Are they joined anywhere? Yeah, they are. They're joined as the kingdom separate. Everywhere else you can separate them. As surgeons, you've really got to get this anatomy down. Because we actually take the whole left and right atriums out from time to time and rebuild them. So, let's see, can we bring mine up? So we're going to really fly. If we can, which way does this go forward? Is it this one or this one? This one. This guy? I'm going to skip a lot of this. You need to memorize. This is interesting. This is Ross and Brunewald from 1968 in circulation. You'll see this over and over and over again about what a great study this was. Do you know how many patients were in this study? 48. <laughs> 48 patients. But it, it's been repeated, and it's been repeated over and over again. When you get symptoms with severe stenosis, you die. And there's, there's, no, there's no other way about it. There is no medical therapy that makes it better. <laughs> the only way to make it better is to relieve the obstruction. That's why it's a class one. I, I, I threw this slide in. I, 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 originally, I had the valves, and then they, they took the valves and gave them the Ross. And I was going to change this on the way to Beijing last week. But because I'm unable to tell the difference between 1 AM leaving and 1 PM leaving, I missed the plane, so I never got on the plane and changed this. But you can see how many different valves there are. And it's just kind of, this, is, this is kind of daunting when you think about it. And it's almost like surgeons, when you start doing catheter valve stuff, you get daunted by the number of wires and catheters. And what you learn is you only need to learn one or two things of each one really only need to learn one mechanical valve that you like and use it over and over again. You need one or two tissue valves. You don't need to know every tissue valve. And once you figure out what you use these tissue valves for, then you kind of go forward there. Uh, that, I don't know why they're missing that, but sutureless valves. Sutureless valves, I think, are going to be very interesting, mainly because they have flow dynamics much like Taver valves. Taver valves have excellent flow dynamics. We'll talk about them. We talked about that, no difference in survival. It's age-related. We see this all the time. My valve's going to wear out in 10 years. Well, it depends on how old you are and what else is going on. We're getting better as surgeons, but one-third to one-half of the people that we see never get referred to us for surgery. Why? Because people think they're old folks. They're old. They're just going to die anyway. Let's just let them go. So, you know, we're nice guys. We, we, tried, we tried to fit, help these people. We tried balloon valvuloplasty back in the 80s. I was part of those trials. And we can open up your valve. I can double your orifice area and half your gradient with a balloon. But it always comes back. So people thought up catheter valves. Uh, Henning Anderson was the one that thought about this. He originally was sitting at a conference listening to Paul Moss talk about his stent. And he got to, went up to Paul Moss and said, why don't we sew a valve in there and put that inside the aortic valve? What do you think Paul Moss told him? You're nuts, buddy. So he went back over to Belgium, and he wanted to do it in his university, and they said, you're nuts. And so he got a surgical resident, and they, they snuck into the lab at night, and they bought a pig, and, and, he, and he built his own valve. And he used, used sternal wires and made the frame from sternal wires and sewed this valve on it and actually showed that it worked. Now, he tried to publish it, and nobody would publish it. And, and, and finally, he presented it at the European Society of, of, of Cardiology as a poster. Nobody cared about it. But then uh, uh, Cribier did the first one in man in 2002, and that one guy actually lived. So Cribier got the first paper. Now, you may feel sorry for Henning. He tried so hard to get the paper, but he had the patent. So if your choice is a patent or the paper, <laughs> take the patent. So, so this, this was the partner trial. This was the partner trial of inoperable patients with medical therapy, which could use balloon valvuloplasty, versus a sapien valve. And there was a 20% difference every year for five years. In fact, in the end of five years, there was only one person left alive in the medical group that hadn't had either surgery or a TAV or hadn't crossed over. And that patient had had three balloon valvuloplasties. So randomization to medical therapy was randomization to death. This is the only time we randomized against medical therapy ever, and it's the only time it'll ever happen because we knew it was randomization that's unethical. So when we did core valve, we could no longer do that. We had to use performance criteria. But again, 
TAVR is much better than, than medical therapy. This is partner A, this was surgery versus TAVR, and there's no difference for five years in the survivability. And this was core valve over three years, and for the first two years, we were statistically superior for TAVR over surgery. First time there's ever been an interventional device superior to surgery, ever, in cardiology. Now, by three years, we lost a statistical superiority, even with a delta of 6.2, but that's not a surprise. The numbers are getting small. Even though the statisticians will tell you those are the same line, I would, I would like my mama on the yellow line, not the blue line. And the other thing that was very interesting about this in the core valve trial was that the forward flow dynamics were statistically superior to surgery at every time point. These valves are stentless valves. They flow. They have amazing flow. And even in the small valves, they flow well, which is one of our big problems in surgery. There's nothing that scares me or Ross more than to get a little tiny old lady. Where you get in, it looks like some in 19 valve, and the cardiologist has told you that the, the AS is bad, and you get in, it doesn't look that bad. You've been done, by, done in by the Gorlin formula, it low flows. And it's just not that bad. Now you're either going to have to do a big annular enlarging procedure on this lady, which increases the risk in little old ladies, or put in a small valve. And that's why just being a woman is a risk factor for getting your valve replaced. Is that because women are just kind of wimpy, not as strong as men? No, women aren't wimpy. I've got two daughters that are tough as nails and a wife who eat me alive every day. It's because women are smaller than men, and they get smaller valves. And, and smaller surgical valves, stented valves, have bad flow, whereas these are stentless valves. And that's why, interesting, that in the TAVR trials, there are about half women, women do so well. It's not because they do so well with TAVR, it's because they do so poorly with surgery. The big problem has been paravalvular leak. We cannot do TAVRs as well as surgery. Now, interesting, when we had superior survival, I went back and looked at it, and this is going to come out in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, and I looked at every single death to try to find out what was the time period of death and why did people die. And interestingly enough, in the first 30 days, there really wasn't a lot of difference in death. There was a whole lot more procedural deaths in TAVR because this was the first time we'd ever done TAVR, whereas we're all experienced surgeons. This procedural death has dropped way down because we've gotten good at it. And then by 30 days, what happens? The, the risk of surgery dying went up. Why is that? Do you get sick at 30 days? Why does the risk, the instantaneous hazard risk of death in surgery go up at 30 days and come down by four months? What's the definition of death in surgical trials? Death within 30 days or in the hospital. We can keep anybody alive at 30 days and send them to an LTAC on day 31. And then what happens? They die a month, month and a half, two months, three months, four months. These were all people that, when you looked at them, never got better. Whereas the TAVR people all went home. Now, by four months, the people that were going to die, died. And you can follow this curve out for three years, and it stays the same. Now, as we move into lower-risk candidates, some of that bump is going to go away because they're not going to be as sick. Uh, partner 2A uh, was the intermediate risk, uh, the Sapien XT versus surgery, uh, second generation and really no difference. Surgery had a slightly higher numeric mortality and disabling stroke, but no difference. That's why the, X, the, S, the uh, S3, which is the newest generation, got just approved for intermediate risk. I'm gonna present the Sertavi data for the Sertavi intermediate risk for the core valve Evolute at ACC coming next year, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'm not going to go over all this. We're pretty late. I'm just going to show you some of the things. These are all still old people. There's still people in their 80s, and I look at risk and age. I've, I'm actually convinced that if you're 80, you might as well have a TAVR valve. These valves are going to last long, as long as surgical valves, despite what everybody got freaked out about Danny DeVere's paper at the EuroPCR this year. But if you looked at this, for the, for the S3 intermediate risk, they, they compared it back against the surgical arm of partner 2A. It was not inferior, not inferior to the combined endpoint. It was really uh, superior for, for death. It was superior for stroke. And the only thing where, surgical, where surgery beat it was in paravalvular leak. Death rate for surgery, 4%, with an, with an STS that was about 5.5. Surgery did pretty good. Had an OD of about 0.67. The death rate, as you saw for the TAVR arm, was like 1%. Had a death, an OD ratio of 0.2. It's really hard to compete with, particularly when we do these under local now and they go to the recovery room and they go home in a couple days. Right now we do five different valves. We do direct flow. Uh, it's a, it's a non-metallic valve. You blow it up. Uh, we do the Lotus, uh, which is a, a mechanically shortened valve, a mechanically expanded nitinol valve. <laughs> Interesting that I can deploy this valve 100%, look at it, decide if I like it. If I like it, I just let it go. If I don't like it, I can unhook it, move it, put in another valve. We, we had one a couple months ago where we put in a 23 valve 
And lo and behold, it just never wasted out, and we pulled on it, and it popped right out. We just sucked it up, put in a 25, and it was perfect. So it's getting more and more like surgery, where you're always going to get the right valve in the right place every time. The Core Valve Evolute series, we, we've run most of those trials for, for Medtronic. Uh, Sapien, S, the Sapien 3, we do those commercially. And then we're part of the Portico trial now, which is also a self-expanding valve. A little different than Core Valve in that Core Valve is super annular and Portico sits in the annulus. We could spend an hour talking about these design things. Now, the interesting thing is in the, direct, in the, in the uh, discovery trial for the direct flow valve, at one year, no moderate to severe paravalve leak, none. If you look at the Reprise 2, which was the Lotus valve in Europe, one year, no moderate to severe paravalve leak. In fact, only 11.4% mild. That's starting to look a lot like a surgical valve. The S3 was about 3.5% in the original European studies. It was 1.4% in the S3 data that was presented by uh, Vino Thorani at the ACC this year. And it's about 3.4% in Evolute, but we're now starting to trial the, we're trialing a new version of Evolute called Evolute 2.0 or Evolute Pro, which has a skirt wrapped around it to stop that leak. And so you can see the trend of this. They're all getting better. So by 2020, we're going to solve that. Remember that Surgery hurts your right heart and hurts your stroke volume. Why does your stroke volume go down if I, if I operate on you versus a TAVR? Well, what do we do when we operate on somebody? We stop their heart. How do we stop their heart? We fill it with this cold chemical. That's really not good for your heart. You get over it, but it takes a while. Your stroke volume goes down if I operate on you. It doesn't happen in TAVR. Your right heart goes down if I operate on you doesn't happen in TAVR. The reason we get away with it is we help you more than we hurt you. But we hurt you less with TAVR. I'm not going to talk about this. Another thing to remember is when you look at all these U.S. trials, remember when the, when the partner trial started, when the core valve trial started? I've been doing every valve surgery for 30 years. To get into the trials of surgery, you had to have at least five years of experience, of, of real experience, not just doing a valve here and there, but real experience. All of us did our first TAVRs in these trials. So we were, we were comparing what was experienced surgeons doing a mature technology against a very young technology where everybody was a neophyte. And the technical disasters that we saw have largely gone away and that, you know, we've improved this a lot. We're not going to improve surgery a whole lot more. It's been around for 60 years. Now remember, surgery is a technique-driven thing. For technique-driven things, things that you have to do, it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert. How do you become an expert? You do it over and over and over again. Technology is different. Technology is a lot easier to learn. So think about a descending thoracic aneurysm that has a good neck at each end. I can take anyone in this room and, have, and show you how to put in a, a T-VAR graft, and it's going to work every time. It's going to be harder for you to go in there and do an, an open operation. It takes a lot of practice. That's going to make TAVR have a wider dispersion across the U.S. Because right now the average U.S. surgeon does how many AVRs? Want to guess? Average U.S. heart surgeon does how many AVRs? Eight. It's worse for mitral repair, but eight. It's hard to be an expert if you're doing eight a year. We used to ask which cases are bad for surgery, and then we'd do a TAVR. We're now starting to say which ones are bad for TAVR anatomically. Maybe we'll operate on them. It's a real switch. And so we used to look at this, that we'd have this risk scale, and there was a bar above which we wouldn't go. You're so sick, we just operate on it. It doesn't matter and a bar which you wouldn't go below, which used to be a high intermediate. We just approved intermediate, so I need to redo this slide and move it over. Both these bars are currently moving to the left, and if durability is found, what we're going to find is in five years, we're going to do anybody that's a tissue valve candidate, and durability is going to be the real key to this.